Ooh, see, this is the kind of stuff they're not showing us in our parenting classes. There is a chance the boy may grow up to be the Antichrist. I'm fairly certain I did run the Church of Satan in a previous life. Plus, the Estes Perkle movies did not convert me at all, so clearly I'm evil. Last week we watched the classic Exorcist, and when you do that, that's when you say to your friends, Hey, let's all go back to the video store and rent The Omen! I hear that one's a classic too! There's an alternate universe where we rented Beyond the Door, and then said, let's go back and rent the children. The Omen is the story of how you should always be honest with your spouse. If your child dies, don't replace the baby. It could be the Antichrist, and you may end up with Nikolai Carpathia. The movie came about from producer Harvey Bernhard being very interested in making a movie about the Antichrist, so screenwriter David Seltzer was hired to put a little something together, to which he'd later say, oh, I wrote that movie just for the money. It's crazy how many people believe in that end times shit, <laughs> right? Plus, it was an early big film for director Richard Donner, whose previous theatrical film had been in 1970 with the rom-com Lola, where <laughs> she's almost 16, he's almost 40. It may be love, but it's definitely exhausting. What? I love that that's the predicament there. She's 16, he's 40, and oh man, oh, it's hard on my back oh, and my knees. Anyway, this has the slightly better poster. You have been warned. If something frightening happens to you today, think about it. Oh, great. What now? I would like you to take a seat, Father. Oh, God. Where's the other one? I'll let them figure out that evil on their own. I can already hear that 70s devil soundtrack playing. It's hard not to instantly think about South Park when hearing this theme, but it's still some great music which got Jerry Goldsmith his only Oscar for best score. There's plenty of names behind the scenes. It was shot by Gilbert Taylor, cinematographer of Star Wars, Flash Gordon, and most importantly, losing it. That's why episode one would have an Omen credits-like poster. It's already an anxious film. It's that time of evening in Rome where you're likely to get car sick. Gregory Peck plays diplomat Robert Thorne, who was the top choice to play the character, though some other actors were considered by the studio, like Oliver Reed, which I could definitely see that, and ironically, William Holden, who would star in the sequel. Other names like Charlton Heston and Dick Van Dyke turned it down, and again, that'd be interesting. Peck did this film when a lot of people thought he had retired, so having a big name like his attached helped assemble other cast and crew members pretty quickly. In this setup, his son has died in childbirth, so he immediately seeks the help of any priest sitting alone in a dark church. Nothing creepy will come out of this! The priest suggests he adopts a child right there on the spot so that his wife doesn't know about it. The technology's not available yet for us to give you a robot child. Wait, no, bring us another. Neither my wife or I are Pakistani. Aha, uh -huh. excellent. Well, that was easy enough. If your child dies, instantly replace it. Like you got your order wrong on DoorDash and they immediately give you a $5 credit on a big Mac. Works out, this child's mom died giving birth. Again, this is very easy. Hey, uh, did, did the mom die? Well, we gotta give this baby to someone. So he gives the new child to his wife, Catherine, played by Lee Remick. Prepare for the ending twist, where it's actually a Russian adult woman posing as a baby. It's some time later, where God is gonna put Robert through the ultimate test to see if he'll ever tell his wife. Great, it's the biblical plague of frog rain and ass snakes, but I still ain't telling her what I did. In better news, he's been promoted to ambassador to Great Britain. It helps being close with Secretary of State Lucifer. I love Gregory Peck. He looks like he could be a U.S. ambassador and ready to give the angels their daily mission, and he wouldn't even have to change his clothes. But let's just say Robert was way lazier at replacing the dog than he was their son. His wife's a little too gullible. 
there's already some problems. Where is that little hell spawn? I do like that it goes the route where a lot of times he looks normal and not too over the top evil. 500 kids auditioned for the role, and it was Harvey Stevens who won out because of the audition process where he attacked the director and kicked him in the groin. So they made his hair darker and gave him contacts. Here's what he looks like beforehand. What? David Seltzer did do some uncredited work on Willy Wonka. Damien's birthday party has everyone, including David Warner as photographer Eric Clapton. And somewhere around here, Burke Dennings is passing out in the nurse bed. Their nanny appears to be rather close with Damien at first, but still doesn't seem sinister right off the bat, despite the signs. Y'all mind giving me a slice of that birthday cake? Save me the candle. It's the best part. Sure, he's satanic, but this is a better birthday party than in Mommy Dearest. Damien will get to keep all of his presents and even exchange his nanny if he doesn't like her. It's all for you. They go all out on pinatas in the UK. It's still not that bad of a day. He does have his new dog. Is it too awkward to ask for seconds on the candle? Look, I told you we didn't see this coming. If we had a nanny from a Lucio Fulci movie, it would have been very obvious from the beginning. Here he bumps into Keith Jennings again, my favorite member of The Who. But it's during a visit from Father Brennan that, uh, what, no, no, I said a reference to The Who, not Doctor Who. The father knows the secret of Damien, demon seed of Beelzebub. For only if he is within you can you defeat the son of the devil. <laughs> Nepo baby. Brennan looks less like Father Karras and more like he's halfway into turning into demon Father Karras. And why are you telling me this now, Father? It took me five years to find parking. <laughs> so he leaves him with some advice that should help. Accept Christ each day. Drink his blood. Could you look less like you're asking me to drink a hooker's blood? The picture will be all the evidence they need. Hmm, just as I suspected. A crack on the lens. Time for a new camera. And they get their new nanny, Mrs. Baylock. Just a spoonful of holy water helps the evil go down in the most delightful way. She's played by Billy Whitelaw, who is really great in this. She comes in like she is the lead character in a family film sent from the sky. Where'd you find her? I didn't find her. I assumed you found her. All right, we'll find out where Nanny McPhee came from. Then I need to get back to work. Well, we don't know how you got here. Oh, oh, the, uh, the agency. See, good enough answer for me. Let her have her alone time with the boy. I am here to protect thee. Ooh, she said thee. That means she's biblical. And has serious issues about Damien going to church. Do you really think a five-year-old will understand the goings-on of an Episcopal wedding? I'm just saying he seems more like a Protestant. I'm very surprised the issue of him going to church hasn't come up sooner. This doesn't mean he's evil. It could be that he's suspicious of any church that looks like an alien ship landed in Denis Villeneuve's arrival. Who wouldn't freak out just a little bit? No! Sunday school teacher can deal with this. Driver, take us to get a Happy Meal right away. We'll be right back. A brand new pony will turn that frown upside down. They're normal, everyday children. Except that something terrifying happened to them. Pray you never meet them. Jenny, darling, is that you? Mama! Children, rated R. Now playing at the Lakeshore and Washington Drive-In Theaters. We're back and Damien's fine. He's just reached the terrible fives. He's got tantrums, but at least he's never been sick before. I mean, no measles or mumps or chicken pox. <clears throat> Not even a cough or a cold. Oh, like it matters. We don't have to worry about health insurance regardless, dear. Just as long as he isn't attacked by the strange dog, we should be good. Ah. Uh... Was that, was that you flirting with me? Oh, uh, the new dog. Uh, uh, we have a new dog? We found him outside. I thought we could use a good watchdog, sir. Hmm, seems legit. 
but we have a three strikes policy on dog maulings here, so watch out. Still, though, he wants her to get rid of the dog. Perhaps Satan should have chosen a poodle or a wiener dog. Something less sinister to be the hound of hell. It's okay, son. We'll take you to the zoo. Pick out any elephant you like and watch out for any weird animals doing satanic horror movie shit. The animals get stupid when Damien is around. Hey, are you got a bucket for me to spit this in? The Antichrist makes them run past Bugs Bunny's hole like when they see the Tasmanian Devil. The animals are already acting strange, so why not go see the baboons? Hoo hoo, an offering to the altar of Satan gives them the red ass. The baboons did get so scary when making the film that the frightened reaction on Lee Remick's face is genuine. Somewhere the screenwriter of Shockma is in a theater and said, I have an idea for a new horror film. That night, she doesn't want to talk about it. I'm never spending hours cleaning giraffe chewing gum off my shoe again. He knows what will fix Damien. Keep that scrum tight! Get down low! Come, Come on! on. Get down. Get down. Sports will teach him discipline. And there's no rule that says the Antichrist can't play rugby. Plus, Father Brennan needs a less creepy approach. Five minutes and you'll never see me again. Your wife is in danger. Get off me. You look like Jack Torrance was only served a non-alcoholic Sambuca milkshake. The pictures will show more answers, or he'll photograph him walking on water for the Being There poster. Son of a bitch, I knew it. Another crack. Who keeps dropping my camera? I'm still keeping it, though. It has one hell of a zoom. At least Robert is open enough to hear the father out now. When the Jews return to Zion. All right, done. I don't know what I was thinking coming here. Could you not speak in Revelation talk? Give it to me straight. You're talking like you made some masks that turn kids' heads into bugs. Or that you're constipated. My wife is in danger. She is pregnant. He will not allow the child to be born. He will kill it while it slumbers in the womb. Now please, give this $50 to the man standing on the corner. He's just giving me some sugar for my tea, I swear. I like this reaction to Father Brennan telling him he needs to kill his son. I never want to see you again. Anything you have to say to me, put it in a letter and send it to my secretary. Also, Satan controls the weather and is going to blow the father right to the moon. Hurry, protect yourself with this piece of sheet metal and hold the cross higher to the sky. Donner's approach to the film was that he wanted it to be debatable whether Damien was the Antichrist, as it's not like Damien is going around killing people. He wanted the audience to question it, too. Like how the deaths could just be a series of accidents. <laughs> Regardless, get him to the Cannibal Holocaust set immediately. The father got off easy in this film. Brennan doesn't have to worry about the headache that comes with babysitting. Oh, honey, it ain't so bad. <laughs> Don't ask me to babysit, by the way. I love when Mrs. Baylock takes him away and Damien's like, oh, I'm gonna remember this day for the rest of my life. One day you will give me back my Transformers. That's enough for Catherine to say that she does not want a second child. I don't ever want to have any more children. All right. Then you'll agree to an abortion. Why, of course. We don't have to deal with the father judging us anymore. Which, by the way, I love that the picture of him impaled is not only in the newspaper, but front page. Enough about that. He's told by the doctor that Catherine is getting suspicious that Damien is evil and also not her child. The most important thing for you to do is to agree to an abortion. What? But Damien is five years old. Oh, the second child, you idiot. He has his reasons for not wanting the abortion. It was foretold that this pregnancy would be terminated. I'm going to fight to see that it's not. Well, I'm not sure that's in either the pro-choice or the pro-life platforms. And evil or not evil, he is a way better Danny Torrance than in the Shining miniseries. But if you bring in that Goldsmith score and camera work that goes upside down... Ooh, he's gonna run the heads off of all his G.I. Joe toys. <laughs> And he turned his mother into a glass bowl of water. 
Oh, never mind. From now until you die, you will see the faces of my Transformers you took from me. Well, this isn't so bad. She just floated from only a couple of feet off the ground. She's okay. I like how it all started for Mrs. Baylock winding him up like a toy and then opening the door as if he's on a Hot Wheels track. The movie is really well acted, with very good music and memorable scenes, but it's also kind of silly, but delightfully silly. The performances do have such gravitas to them, same with the music, that I am invested, especially when she lies in bed and says, don't let him kill me. Plus, he didn't have time to go back to the church to adopt a second baby, so he just dressed up this kitten. Let's take a break so he can pad the entire bottom floor with pillows in case someone falls again. You're gonna need a mighty strong pillowcase for that. Thankfully, we've got the Cinema Snob Doki Makura pillow. And you don't even have to swap it out when the holiday season comes. Just simply flip it over and you got me in a Santa onesie. Pick up yours today by clicking the link in the comments and in the description or head over to LoadingCrewCrafts.com. See you there. Now that we're back, Robert will head to the church to immediately replace his stairs. Honey, I understand you're sad, but why are you sleeping in the attic? Oh, oops, this is my son's room. I forgot that's where we keep the rabid stray dogs. I'll leave you be. Then the real investigative part of the movie comes in when Keith Jennings calls and asks if his band The Kinks can play at his swearing-in ceremony. He also has important information, as there's some peculiar coincidences in these photos. Look, she relieved her bowels in both of these images. I really just need any excuse not to purchase a new lens. <laughs> They're expensive. And let's not forget the birthmark on the father's side. Concentration camp. What? No. Why does your head always go there? Father Brennan's room even raises suspicion. Hmm, I think the answer is quite obvious. Father Brennan was a serial killer. And how were we allowed in here? The police thought he was insane, so they didn't mind me coming here and rummaging around to see if I could find anything of use. That's how that works. Ah, this guy was crazy. Take anything you want. We left all the newspaper clippings sitting around, too. Like how a comet became the star of Bethlehem, but on the other side of the world, right when Damien was born, on the sixth day of the sixth month at 6 a.m. A little on the nose today, aren't we, Satan? God damn it, why didn't the father tell me any of this? He just quoted end time speak and smelled of Jack Daniels. Keith has a lot at stake here too. He caught his own reflection in the mirror, which shows that at some point, he's going to fall into the crack of the Titanic. As for Mrs. Baylock, though, I'm sure she's on the up and up. She did have recommendations, aside from the whole dog thing. Last night, I saw that dog in Damien's room. I clearly told you. He's gone now, sir. They took him away this morning. Oh, um, I was just starting to get to know him. I even brought him a steak from the butcher. Now for a series of things working out tragically, the old hospital in Rome burnt down five years ago, and even just yesterday, there was a terrible accident at Scoops Ahoy. There's not even anything left in terms of any adoption or birth records. And where's Father Spoleto? There was a tall man, a priest, dark eyes, piercing eyes. Ah, see, si, see, si, Father Bruce. Now be on your way. She's taking the dumbwaiter back up to heaven now. Um, bye. A lot of these prophecies contain huge spoiler alerts for future movies. So the devil's child will rise from the world of politics. And it will be one hell of a scene-stealing performance. They at least know where Father Spoleto is now. He should be here among these monks made up entirely of every dad's bowling league. Sadly, he's now mute and halfway through his makeup session for the church's haunted house in the Halloween season. But Gregory Peck's voice is as powerful as the voice of God, so if anyone can get the father to talk, it's him. Though it takes him so long to write the name of the cemetery, it puts in an establishing shot right in the middle of it. I'm gonna go get some coffee. Tell me when he's done. 
And are you sure you want to be hanging around a cemetery? Think of the omen curse! Because of course the movie has a curse. There's always a curse in these kinds of movies. Peck and David Seltzer's planes were hit by lightning. Peck almost boarded a plane that crashed. The producer was staying at a hotel that was bombed. Jesus! Maybe it's for the best they're not digging up graves. Though they found Damien's mother in the unmarked grave next to Arch Stanton. These graves also contain Robert's actual son, who was intentionally killed so the baby Damien could take his place. A couple of questions. Did he not wonder what happened to the body of his real son? This was a lot of planning, hinged on Robert definitely going to adopt a baby without his wife knowing. Was every doctor in the hospital in on this? Hell, now I just assume it was the hounds of hell that went into the hospital to murder the child. It would have made our jobs a heck of a lot easier if your wife just simply gave birth to Damien. But who are we to question the prophecy? Y'all come see us again and bring some flowers next time. They got them all excited. They'll be barking for a while. <laughs> well, so much for the groundskeeper getting any sleep tonight. Darling, it's me. Whatever you do, do not give Mrs. Baylock a recommendation letter for her next job. <laughs> we'll be right back. Tuesday, meet Mike and Betty, the average American couple with two kids and Lucky, the family dog. Only one thing is wrong. Some evil power has moved into my house. It's taken over my wife and my children. It's a Halloween you'll never forget. Devil Dog, the Hound of Hell, Tuesday at 9, 8 Central and Mountain, right after the paper chase. The commercial is over now, honey. I need you to get the hell out of that hospital. Oh, sure, I'll do just that. Easy enough. I'll walk out of here if I could just get this damn gown on and no one stops me with devil music. Yes, my plan is perfectly perfect in every way. For it is written in the book of Revelation, push her out the damn window. <laughs> That explains the pictures where there was a floating ambulance behind her. Hello? Uh, what happened? Uh, oh, oh God. But, but is the dog okay? Don't worry. You still have me, Robert. I'll play you one of my songs. Do you know Heartful of Soul? Let's not let that get in the way of the next phase of their plan. Kathy is dead. I want Damien to die, too. <laughs> yeah, kill that kid. This leads them to find Father Marin. Maybe he has some kind of smaller version of the Pazuzu statue. One they can bash the kid on the head with. Look, people have been giving you drunken premonitions all throughout the film. What makes you think Rip Torn will be any different? Here, Leo McKern gives him the tools he needs to destroy the Antichrist, while Keith keeps looking around. Hmm, there's got to be something here that'll eventually cut my head off. The plan is to kill Damien on hollowed ground with seven daggers. And if that doesn't work, send him to bed without his dinner! Just to make sure, though, before you stab him to death, he has to see if Damien has the 666 birthmark. Still some doubt, though. He needs a better sign. Ah, yes, slapstick. The devil's favorite type of pranks. And the editor's, too. The decapitation scene was edited in such a way that it would show it from different angles, so if anyone closed their eyes, it'd still be going on when they opened them. No need to stick around for that crime scene. The police were nice enough to let him leave with his knives. At least there's still one friend he has in the house. Did you bring me back a cannoli? Okay, gonna cut his hair to check for those three sixes. It ain't too dangerous. What? We keep a fireplace in the room he sleeps in. Whew, good thing the sixes were in the first place he cut. Damien could have woken up with a real stupid haircut come morning. Still could be a coincidence though, right? Donner and the producers did consider not having Mrs. Baylock in the film, since she is the one character that makes it very, very clear this is all for real, as opposed to leaving a little bit of doubt like the director wanted. But they loved her so much in the movie, they kept her in, and rightfully so. I wish she was in the movie more. 
I love that part of this is an Antichrist movie, and part of it is the hand that rocks the cradle. The movie does have good pacing, and that Robert's arc isn't a quick one, which makes it feel more natural when he goes from this loving father to, I've killed the nanny and now I must stab the child on hollowed ground. It gives the tone more of a mystery feel, as opposed to being a killer kid movie like The Good Son or something like that. Really, Damien is barely in the flick. It's a good film because of people like Gregory Peck and some of the characters, and Donner's direction, and it does have a pretty great climax. I haven't seen it since high school, and watching it now, I can't say I was scared, but I was entertained, and there is good suspense. There's a lot of silliness in it and questions, but I respect that it does it all with a great poker face. Here, I love that the kid is still trying to get him to stop by saying, No, Daddy! And there being a second of doubt. No matter, it's the only time the police have done anything in this film, and you doomed us all! This is certainly a go-to movie that people think of off the top of their heads when asked about a 70s horror film because of some of the famous images, like we all remember the evil grin at the camera at the end, where he's now being taken care of by the president. Guess that doesn't work out. He's living with Robert's brother in the second film. Despite its popularity, it got very mixed reviews at the time, and I can kind of see why. Though it was included in the 70s book, The 50 Worst Films Ever Made, which I wouldn't go nearly that far. I've seen how this kind of movie can go really wrong. This movie's at least ambitious. And I do like its themes, which ask, given the time period we're in, if the signs of the end times would even be noticeable in this day and age. But am I the only one that likes the third one the best? And yes, that is absolutely due to Sam Neill. Despite the mixed reviews, it was one of the highest grossing movies of 1976, and its success led Donner to direct Superman. And let's not forget the Richard Donner cut of Damien the Omen 2. Cause that's right, it got franchised to hell, with two theatrical sequels, a TV movie sequel, a 2006 remake, and a TV series. We're checking all the franchise boxes there. <laughs> Ow, who's that down there? I have been tasked with demanding a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, Father. Ugh, sure. What flavored jelly? Thanks a lot for burning everything down, you little bitch!